Amen. Well, um, the scripture says, and God says in 2 Corinthians this, uh, my grace is sufficient for you. My grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. Well, if you read the Old Testament record, story after story is there of real and flawed people who, uh, you know what, they want to love God. They love God most of the time. They want to honor God most of the time. They want to trust him most of the time. They want to be faithful to him most of the time. But most of the time, they kind of want to do it their own way. I can resonate with that. And so they get themselves into trouble to the point where they realize they need God's help and they cry out to God for help. And time and time again, their God, our God, the only true God, rescues, helps, aids, encourages, supports, and he graces them. We're in this sermon series called Grace. And those people, just like us, need God to come in and save the day. Where do you need help? Where, where is it that you need encouragement? In order to really invite you into this, I thought, you know what, Jody? Put your money where your mouth is. Share a little bit about what you struggle with. Because I think sometimes people have this misconception that the people who stand up here, um, maybe more than most, have their act together maybe act more like Jesus more often. Hey, listen, if you have that conception in your mind, you should get rid of it. It's just not true, all right? So uh, not this week, the week before was a really challenging week for me. I'm a third year um, student at seminary, so I've got one year left. I'm really excited about that. In May, I'll graduate. And um, it's hard work, right? They call it a class load for a reason, yeah? Lots of, uh, lots of studying, lots of reading, lots of papers, lots of class. And I love the opportunity. I'm super thankful for it. But there are times uh, I was looking at the calendar, I was lining up the expectations, and I was just more than a little overwhelmed by it all. And then I get the opportunity to lead a ministry to middle schoolers and their families. And uh, along with amazing teammates, um, we work in the lives of children, middle school and high school together. That's about um, 400 children and students uh, that we have opportunity to help disciple. And that's about 130 volunteers weekly that we get to work with. And I love it. And then there are times when it's kind of overwhelming. Uh, and add to that that I'm a mom and a wife. And I don't know if this is what it looks like in your house. But when I get a little overwhelmed, a little stressed... They see the ugliest parts, right, of that. So I'm less patient. I'm less understanding. I communicate less effectively. (laughs) That's an understatement. (laughs) They see that. And these are the people we love most, right? Praise the Lord, they love us. But that's hard. That's hard. Sometimes the burden of that kind of stacks up. But um, when I look at my struggles and I compare them to some of my friends. It's like a stroll through the park compared to scaling Mount Everest. I have uh, one of my best friends, Emily Wellnut. Some of you may know her. Um, She was on our council. Uh, Emily got a horrible phone call uh, this summer that her brother and her 11 and 9-year-old nephew and niece were killed in a car accident while they were on vacation. Left behind were uh, Ben's wife, and their seven-year-old daughter. Hmm. So Emily and her family moved from here up to Cedar Falls to be just blocks away from her sister-in-law and niece to be a significant support in the midst of real life struggle. There's lots of pain. And maybe this doesn't seem big, but it is kind of to me. Uh, My parents, they've lived in the same house since before I was born, same town, Waverly, Iowa, and they've decided they're going to sell their house. They're going to move to Des Moines. And for me, this is not just a building. This is my neighborhood. This is the whole foundation, right? This is a big deal. It's not just a building. It's like part of my family. And so all of this stuff was going on, and 
feeling like it was building on t- I, I think you can resonate with me. And um, I just needed a really good cry. So a week ago Thursday, I didn't have just a good cry. I had an ugly cry. <laughs> yeah, if you haven't gone there before, you really ought to. It's pretty important. And uh, I just was, you know, it was like I was on a merry-go-round. I'm not such a fan of rides like that, by the way. I like these, but yeah. And it was like I just wanted to say, stop, 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 I need off, I need off, can we pause? I just need, I need a moment. And it was a rotten feeling, and I realized that um, I was doing a pretty good job of messing up by just carrying load after load and putting it on and thinking I had to figure it all out. I needed to be the best friend that anybody could have when they're going through the worst thing ever, I needed to be the best mom and the best wife and the best ministry leader and the best student. All of this together is me just wanting to be the hero, to be honest with you. I want, you know, I like a challenge. Somebody says, there's a mountain, let's go, I'm going. But guess what? I'm not the hero of my story. And God was putting that up in front of my face pretty clearly and still is. I am not the hero of my story. You are not the hero of your story. God is the hero of the story. Are you at a point in your life when you're looking at things going on and you deal with worry or fear or confusion or being overwhelmed? Oftentimes it's because I think I need to look like an adult in the midst of things that are frustrating and uh, painful and a struggle. I think I need to act like I've got it together, but the reality is I am not the hero of my story, and neither are you. And when we try to be that, it's kind of like those Israelites. We want to go our own way, and then we come to the end of ourselves, and we realize, well, I hope, if you haven't realized this, I hope you do today, that you are not enough. God is, he is enough. He is actually, he is more than enough. So if you're concerned about things like your marriage or your job or your um, classes or your parenting or your health, God has something for you today. We can fast forward in Israel's history to when they were in the promised land for quite a while. They had um, built homes, they had jobs, they had friends, they had the temple, which is really, really important to them. And um, the Babylonians came in and invaded, invaded Jerusalem and um, took over, okay? And so one of the tactics in war uh, at that time was that they took the leaders of the community, those who were the influencers, and they would take them out of the community. They sent them into exile. They sent them far away, okay, in order to, to maybe be able to manipulate the general populace more. And so... These people were sent away apart from anything that they knew before. And um, you can imagine that stunk. Uh, Author Eugene Peterson talks about it being like like a shoulder dislocated, okay? Like things are just not where they're supposed to be. These people are sent away from everything they know and love. And so the prophet Jeremiah writes a letter to, to these people who are in exile, and he says, here's what God wants you to do. Put down roots build houses, and make yourself at home. Now, if I were one of those people, I'd be like, are you kidding me? Let's get out of here, right? Trying to figure out how to to evade the pain, to get rid of it, to find the solution. But God says something different. Put down roots. And so that's what God's people do. I'm sure it was not easy. Um, Eugene Peterson says this about exile. The only, and I think it's for us too, the only place you have to be human is where you are right now. The only opportunity you will ever have to live by faith is in the circumstances you are provided this very day. So God's word for you and for us, especially when life is filled with struggle, is this. I am attentive, God says. I am attentive to your struggle, to your situation. I care about you. I love you. I am sufficient for you. I am enough. You know, it's hard, isn't it? It's hard to be the perfect 
husband or wife. It's hard to be the perfect parent. Goodness knows that becomes really evident, right? Our children remind us, show us that we are not perfect. It's hard to be the perfect uh, person in our job. It's hard to do all the... In fact, it's impossible, isn't it? You might try, but here's the deal. In the midst of real life and real struggle, I want to be the hero, but I am not the hero of my story. I want to be victorious. I want to solve the problem. I want to be there and be a part. You know what? I want to be, I want to be the hero. I want the glory. But I am not the hero. You are not the hero. God is the hero of the story. And today, as we are watching these pictures, where it's all Saint Sunday, we, right in front of our faces, are reminded of the fact that we are separated by death from people that we love. They're not just a phone call or a hug away. At any moment, in fact, the things that we love most can be stripped away from us. Just Friday, as Pastor Perry mentioned, a funeral of a two-year-old who battled cancer. Life is not fair. It doesn't make sense. There are not nice answers to our questions in all things. We'd like it to be that way. It's just the reality is that that isn't the way it is. And we don't understand, and we are not the hero. Left to our own to sort things out, we realize that we cannot save the day. So uh, superheroes. Anybody have a few superheroes arrive at their front door last night by chance? Raise your hand if you saw a few superheroes. (laughs) Love them. Definitely prefer them to the scary things, right? Uh, Thank you, superheroes. Thank you for coming to my door. Okay, superheroes, um, they all have symbols, if you haven't noticed, it seems to me. I don't know. I'm not a superhero expert, but I thought we'd quiz you a little bit, if that's okay, with some um, of the most popular superhero symbols or emblems that represent them, right? All right, so let's check it out. Who is this? Batman. All right, how about the next one? Spider-Man. All right, next. Love Captain America. He's probably my favorite. How about this one, 80s kids? <laughs> Mighty Mouse. Raise your hand if you have no idea who that is. It's okay. It's okay. Yeah. We're getting old, people. Okay. Mighty Mouse. How about this one? Tran- the ones who raise their hand know that one. Okay. How about the next one here? Wonder Woman. Yay. All right. And the next one? Avengers. Love the Avengers. And last... Superman. Did you know this? I had no idea. My life has been changed in the last two weeks. Did you know Superman had a cousin? You did? I didn't know this. Okay, what's her name? What was it? Supergirl. Her name is Supergirl. There's this brand new TV show called Supergirl. I can't say I'm recommending it. I'm just saying, okay? So Supergirl is, uh, her real name is Kara Zarel. And um, after saving the day, she realizes that she needs to have kind of the superhero ensemble, okay? So she's working on um, what it is she's supposed to have as her uniform and her emblem and whatever. Check out this, uh, this video clip. Good. It's my family's coat of arms. Now, if you don't know what that means, it's basically like a symbol, an illustration that represents your family. And so she says, it's not an S. It's my family's coat of arms. I saw that. I was like, hmm, that's good stuff. A family's symbol. The mark of the only true, and if this is going to shatter your life, those people aren't real, okay? 
Sorry, moms and dads, if I just ruined the rest of your day. Uh, they're not real. They're made up. They're cool, but they're made up. The one and only true superhero has the mark of a cross. Jesus, who had victory over sin, who was nailed to the cross and paid for our sin. This is that verse at the beginning. My power is made perfect in weakness. This is the perfect picture of that. Jesus, who is God in human form, on a cross to pay the price for us in weakness. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. And in true superhero fashion, that cross is empty. Because our superhero isn't even, um, isn't, isn't even phased ultimately by death. More powerful than death itself. The cross, the empty cross, is our family's coat of arms. It is the ultimate symbol of grace. God said to Paul in this letter to, second, to the Corinthians that we read at the beginning, for my grace is sufficient for you, my power is made, is made perfect in weakness. God said that to Paul, he says it to you, that my grace is enough for you. When the Israelites were in exile, this was the most creative time in their history, okay? In the darkness of being away from home, they were brought into, um, like, they realized that they were human in a brand new way. They were grounded in their identity, in who they really are. And they were brought back to the true foundation that is the one true God. So where are you weak? Where are you in exile? Where is it time for you to get real about this reality? Because it's there that God's grace is sufficient. It's sufficient. A couple of weeks ago, there were about 50 women from here who went to a conference called Women of Faith in the Twin Cities. And it was a great weekend. Um, really great speakers, um, worship time, good time to just be together. And we were really challenged by speakers who were sharing some incredible struggles that they had been facing or were facing in their lives. And honestly, I think one of the biggest takeaways for us, for me specifically, is, is that I want this place to be more and more of a place where people can come and bring what's really going on with them. Like, we don't have any time for masks, friends, all right? What it, now, I'm not saying we are going to get this perfect. I'm just saying, what can we do, God, to be more and more of a place where people can come and bring what's really going on with them in their lives? And uh, on the way home, it was probably the highlight of the trip, um, we had a microphone on the bus, and so we kind of opened the microphone up to people to just share what God was doing in their lives, um, or even just what their struggles were. And we prayed together, and there were some tears, and it was so important and so beautiful and a time of real strength. You know, um, we're not the heroes of our stories, and that, that definitely hit home for me as we were on our bus ride home. You know, Paul when he wrote the uh, Corinthians, right before he talks about God's power being made perfect in weakness, he talks about a massive struggle that he had. He called it a thorn in the flesh. We're not really sure what it is, if it was an ailment uh, of some kind physically or something else, but he struggled. And this guy, by the way, did not live a, uh, I mean, it was a hard life. You should learn more about Paul if you haven't heard about, I mean, uh, movies. It would, he, his story would put movies to shame. He says that three different times he pleaded to God, would you take this away? Would you take this struggle away? And it says that it stayed there. My grace is all you need, God said. My power is made perfect in your weakness. Now, Paul wanted that to be taken away. We've got struggles. Our hero will eventually save the day. But in the meantime, pain is real. Struggle is real. Sickness is real. Broken relationships are real. Pain, it's real. Regret, it's real. Sin, it's real. But the Savior, he is real. He is real. And our Savior says, in fact, promises, kind of wish he wouldn't have, but he says, in this world, you will have trouble. Some people think that following Christ will allow their lives to be smoother. Jesus promised the opposite. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. 
I have overcome the world. Are you enough for you? Is Jesus enough for you? The Israelites earlier in their story were in slavery in Egypt. They were being treated horribly. And God eventually freed them from slavery. And if you know how this goes, it was the first Passover, where the blood of a perfect lamb, uh, the blood would be um, put on the doorpost as a sign of the Spirit of God to pass over in the final battle between Egypt and God. And it was that blood that, that was a sign that helped them walk into freedom and eventually to the promised land. But what that little, that little journey should have taken just a few weeks. Instead, it took 40 years. And I think this would be me. It was them. Uh, 40 years, there was some compl- complaining, some uh, frustration. People were at times even thinking they'd rather be in slavery than been doing this. But time and time again, God was providing for them. And one of the ways he did this was with what they ate. Um, God provided manna. Some of you are going to take your first communion in these wafers. It kind of remind me a little bit of maybe what manna might have been like. It was enough bread for that day. God provided enough. It came, it rained down from heaven. It's crazy. You should read about it. And, uh, and they, they would have enough for that day. They were supposed to take enough for that day. They weren't supposed to hoard it, keep it out of fear that maybe it would go away. If they kept some, hoarded it, it would rot. You know, fear can do that, right? Fear makes things rot. Fear can turn joy into worry. Fear can uh, take contentment and make it discontentment. Fear can take faith and just make more fear. So what do you know? True to his word, God provided all that they needed, and eventually they made it to the promised land. Give us this day. Jesus taught us, give us this day our daily bread. That's a good prayer. Enough for that day. Well, today we're going to celebrate Holy Communion. Jesus celebrated the Passover, the the remembrance, the celebration of that day when God freed his people from slavery. We celebrate that meal, but it's the blood of the only true perfect lamb that is smeared on a different wooden structure. One is our heart when we receive Jesus as Lord and Savior. It's the cross, that wooden structure then Jesus' blood that streaked that structure, and it brings freedom from slavery to sin and to death. We then will know and know and can know freedom today and for eternity because of what Jesus has done. So what area of your life needs this news today, that God is enough? Don't look too far ahead. Sometimes we anticipate, and often we anticipate wrongly. But for today, this day, where do you need a hero? And by the way, our hero is powerful enough to raise the dead to life, to bring encouragement to those who are discouraged, to heal the broken. That is amazing grace. So where do you need your hero to save the day? Maybe not in the way that you wish it would be, but without a doubt, saving the day. And that phrase is kind of interesting, isn't it? Save the day. It doesn't say save tomorrow or save forever. But interestingly enough, our our hero does that too. But for today, our hero says, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Max Cicado, the author of the book Grace, which we've been using in this sermon series and in our small group, says this. I just want to share it with you. Grace is simply another word for God's tumbling, rumbling reservoir of strength and protection. It comes at us, not occasionally or miserly, but constantly and aggressively, wave upon wave. Will you pray with me, please? Lord Jesus, we love you. Thank you for your grace that you pour out for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.